Uh, if you got your Bibles, I'm going to ask you to turn to Luke 15 one more time. And uh, we've, uh, we've been talking about AHA over these past five weeks now. Number, this is number six. And uh, if you've been here over that period of time, many of you could do this recap as well as I can. In fact, you could do it better than me probably. And so we've been saying that AHA is a, it's a, it's an acronym. It stands for uh, Awakening, Honesty, and Action. And uh, we've been saying over this past few weeks that when these three things come together, that uh, it's a recipe for transformation. It's a recipe for change. And so we said that, you know, for the very first part of that, that awakening aspect, that you have this awakening, sometimes this sudden awakening, that something isn't right. Your life is in the pig pen. And maybe you utter these words for yourself for the very first time, I'm an addict. Or maybe uh, she files for divorce. Or your kids don't want anything to do with you. you. You have an awakening. And then that's followed by some brutal honesty. Uh, this is sometimes the most difficult conversation to have is the one that you have to have with yourself. And so instead of making excuses like you've done in the past, uh, blaming someone else, you take responsibility. You, you confess the reason why you are where you're at today. And then, as we talked about last week, the action part of this is sometimes uh, super, super difficult. It's, it's noble to recognize the problem. It's noble to, to be honest with yourself that it's, it's you. You're the reason that the, why you got there. But it's difficult sometimes to act. It's difficult to, to, to end a dating relationship that's uh, hurting your relationship with the Lord. It's difficult to change your diet. It's difficult to tell the truth, to check into rehab, uh, maybe even to finally surrender your life to Christ for the very first time. But that's aha. That's what we've been talking about. And we've been studying Jesus' maybe the most famous uh, parable that he teaches, story that he teaches, the one that Charles Dickens said is the greatest short story of all time. And uh, it is fascinating, isn't it? And it got me thinking a little bit about stories and what makes a great story. We talked about it a little bit in Sunday school. You know, what's your favorite book that you read at all time? And, and have you ever just sort of looked up maybe sort of like all-time uh, list in terms of uh, top 10 movies and and of course that's subject to the person who's doing the writing the list right I mean you could make up your own top 10 but if you sort of look through there you know you'll have some common top 10 movies of all time and so um, a lot of these lists I looked at like the number one movie just shout out what you think the number one movie of all time not necessarily your favorite but of all time any guess Lion King okay what, gone with the wind, did you say? Footloose, all right, Footloose. I wouldn't expect, uh, you know, that's Mary's favorite Footloose. Uh, the Wizard of Oz was actually, did somebody say that? I thought maybe I heard that. Oh, uh, is, is typically, that's really, really high at, uh, you know, at the top of the list, The Wizard of Oz. And uh, I, I can see that there were others, many of these, some of these I haven't seen, um, but some of them I have. The Godfather, uh, Citizen Kane is really high, that's a movie I haven't seen. Uh, E.T., The Shawshank Redemption, uh, Forrest Gump. Uh, everybody's got their favorites, right? You could probably, you know, throw in something, a different one in there. But for most of us, what good stories all have in common, almost that there's a, an unexpected twist at the end, right? And so for The Wizard of Oz, anybody in here not seen The Wizard of Oz, I'm about to give you a spoiler alert. Jill, your homework this week is to go watch The Wizard of Oz. Here, here, but here's a spoiler. I'm sorry. I'm going to tell it. Of course, it came out in 1939. If you ain't seen it yet, it's on you. But here's the spoiler alert, right? Um, we find out in the end that the wizard is a fraud, right? That, that uh, the lion uh, and the scarecrow and the tin man, they all had all along what they were looking to, that they hoped to find, the qualities. Uh, Dorothy didn't really travel to the land of Oz. She only had a dream. But it was a great story, sort of with a cool twist. Uh, the parable of the prodigal son is much more than just a short story. Obviously, Jesus is using it to teach us truths about uh, ourselves, truths about God, ultimately. But it's incredible because the ending happens differently than anyone would expect, right? And most of us, we know this how it ends. Like, we talked about it even last week. And again, this is probably familiar for most of us. But today is probably going to be sort of a second, maybe surprising, Today's sort of going to have a, a second ending that maybe you really wasn't thinking about or prepared for. 
but I think this one is going to maybe land closer to us than, than maybe even all these others before. And so let's read it one more time from Luke 15, beginning in verse 11. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all that he had. He set off for a distant country and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country and he began to be in need. And so he went and he hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to the field to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. And so this younger son, again, often is the one that we refer to as the prodigal son, decides that living with the father is uh, not what he wants anymore, and so he asks for his inheritance, essentially saying, look, Dad, I, I, like, I, I wish you were dead, and um, sets off for the distant country. But the distant country isn't uh, what, he, what he cracked up to be, and it's not so much a a distant location specifically, but it's a location that Jesus is describing as somewhere far from God, who the, is the Father that's represented in this story. And obviously it doesn't go well for the Son. It never does when we try to live our life apart from our Heavenly Father. But He's about to have a breakthrough. And so let's keep reading verse 17. When He came to His senses, He said, How many of my Father's hired servants have food to spare? Here I am starving to death. I'll set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and he went to his father. And so this is where we see this, his aha moment. Jesus said he came to his senses. He came to his senses. His eyes were open. He recognized the problem that he had. Then he was honest about it. He, he, he was honest about what landed him there. What did he say? He said, I have sinned. I've sinned. He could have blamed the weather. He could have blamed the economy. He could have blamed the, 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 uh, his, his father for being too permissible. But he took ownership. And then he takes action. He got up. He got up out of the pig pen. Literally, he had a resurrection. We talked about that last week. And he got up. And his action brought about new life. And we think about this, and we read this, we're like, well, yeah, that's, like, of course he did. Of course that's what he did, what he would have got up to do. He would have went back home, right? But you have to think about this. When he asked his father for his inheritance, he's basically telling them, I'm done with y'all. I'm done. I'm leaving. I'm out of here. And it would have, like, it would have, and he went and he embarrassed their name. He wasted so much money. He's carrying around all this guilt and fear. It wouldn't have been easy to go home. Because if this story ends the way that most people think it's going to end or expect it to, the younger son is either not going to be welcomed or he's got to pay. He's got to pay for his mistakes. He's got to pay his family back. He's got to do one thing or the other. Verse 20. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. And he ran to his son. He threw his arms around him and he kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servant, Quick, bring the best robe and, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. And we said last week, this is where the story shifts from the prodigal to the father. This is where it shifts to, like, and if we heard last week, we talked about this is a picture of God's grace. And the fact that we have left the father, we have gone to the distant country. Every person in here, right, we've been disobedient. We've embarrassed his name. We've been immoral. We've been unfaithful. And yet God waits for us to return home. And so while he was a long way off, the father ran, and he embraced the son, and he throws a party. And the father, you know, we said just as the father celebrates the return of son, uh, his son, heaven rejoices in the angels' party when prodigal children come home. And we could say, the end, right? The end. Everyone loves a happy 
ending, right? Anybody get upset when the story doesn't end the way you hoped? I know Jenny does. Like if the ending, like if it's not a happy ending, she is upset about it. We could say, you know, the end, right? But it's not the end. Do you remember how this story started? Jesus says, he begins this story by saying, there was a man who had two sons. Two sons. We sort of forget about the other son. Right? This is, a, this is a story about two sons. Can you imagine what Jesus' original hearers must have thought when he got to this part about the father forgiving this prodigal son, throwing this party for him? They would have had to imagine that's the end. What an incredible twist. The son deserved punishment. He deserved to be shunned, yet he got graced. And you have to imagine it was at this point Jesus took a long pause and he said, Meanwhile, the older son was out in the field. We forget about him. We get so wrapped up in this story about this younger son, we forget there's an older brother that's got to be dealt with here. Verse 25, meanwhile, the older son was in the field, and when, the, when he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. And so he called one of his servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come. He replied, and your father has killed the fatted calf because of him, and, and he has him back safe and sound. And the older brother became angry and refused to go in. Now, maybe we would just assume the older brother's happy, that the older brother's going to celebrate, the older brother's going to want to party here, but that's not what happens. In fact, the older brother is so mad that he will not even go into the house. Verse 28 the second part of it so his father went out and pleaded with him but he answered his father look all these years i've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders yet you never gave me even a young goat so i could celebrate with my friends but when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home you kill the fattened calf for him the older brother's upset because while he was out in the field working hard, doing what was expected of him, there was a party going on for this no good younger brother. And he said, I have been doing this all my life, and you never once threw a party for me. What's going on? Like, what are you doing, Dad? And, and there's part of us, like, some of us are like, you know, he's kind of got a point. I mean, he sort of got a point. I mean, right? I mean, this, the, the, the father didn't throw a p party for, for that son. I mean, what, what's, what's going on here? And that's why for so many of us today, this message is going to hit home so much more, maybe even in the previous five leading up to this, because there's two sons here. Jesus isn't just talking about one. For us to fully understand what the big point of this parable, we've got to go back and catch it all in context. You remember in, in Luke 15 how this thing started? Jesus tells three consecutive stories. And he begins this section of teaching by saying these words in Luke 15, 1. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. That ought to ring a bell. Because we talked about that. We were, I did an entire series just leading up to this about all the people that Jesus ate with. And so you've got these groups of people that are hearing Jesus. You have these outcasts, these tax collectors and sinners, people who were far from God. The religious people could not stand Him. And then you had the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, the religious people of the day, uh, preachers, pastors, Sunday school teachers, right? And so Jesus isn't simply addressing those who are far away from God, the, the, the prodigals and the lost. He's addressing the religious crowd. In fact, most of the time, this parable gets told to people who are far from God that God's full of grace and mercy to highlight how good of a father he is, and we need to do that, and we need to preach that. But this parable also is addressing someone very, very important. This parable is, is addressing the religious people. This parable is addressing the church. In fact, truth be told, that's the target. Who Jesus is ultimately addressing here is the religious people, the Pharisees, of his day because here's the matter 
Here's the truth of the matter. Listen. The older son is lost too. We say, well, the, that younger son, when well, he was lost, he went off his school. But listen, the older son is lost too. Tim Keller, who I quote often, just recently passed away uh, just a couple of weeks ago. He puts it like this. The bad son was lost in his badness, but the good son was lost in his goodness. How many of us, we skim right past this part of the story and end with a celebration, but when you do that, you're missing half of the point. And not only that, but for many of us, this older brother story is our story. If you've been in church most of your life as an adult or whatever, like this is like, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but, but we fit in one of these two descriptions. Like you're either someone who has spent a lot of time in the distant country, you got the scars to prove it, or you are an elder brother and you've spent the majority of your life maybe in church, maybe within religious circles. But the problem is with that second one that we're talking about today, the older brother, that ironically often what happens is it leads to pride and self-righteousness. Notice the sins of the younger brother and the elder brother are almost identical. The younger brother, for example, he was selfish. What did he say? Give me my share of the inheritance. The older brother, what's his sin? He was selfish. He said, uh, you never had a party for me. The, the younger brother, he was immature. He left and squandered all of his wealth. The older brother, he was immature. He refused to go into the party. The younger brother, he was self-indulgent. He gratified himself by the wild living. The older brother was self-righteous. He said, I've always obeyed you. See, the older brother was just as lost as the younger brother. Do you see it? Listen, church, listen. It is entirely possible to spend your whole life religiously following God and yet miss the heart of the Father. Do you understand this? See, that was the problem with the Pharisees. That's the danger that many of us face who've grown up in church, you've had it in your entire life. It's easy to catch this older brother syndrome. How do you know if you've adopted that? How do you know if you've adopted that older brother mentality? Let me give you some, uh, some examples here. You might, uh, you might, I almost went with a Jeff Foxworthy, you might be an older brother uh, redneck if you do, not, not that, like if you are, so here's, you may be, you may have this older brother mentality if you're constantly critical of the sins of others, right? If you're quick to point out some stuff going on in somebody else's life, if you're quick to point out their sins, even if they repent, you're like, well, you know what? It's probably just a matter of time. They're going to go right back to it, right? If you're skeptical, like you, th this may be this older brother mentality that's kind of deep in your heart, and you may not even realize it. You've probably heard me say, if you've been around for very long, a thousand times, if you're not the biggest sinner you know, you don't know yourself very well. Like you're not evaluating, you're not paying attention to your own heart. You're not paying attention to the junk that's in there. You're not paying attention to your attitude. You're not paying attention to your motives. If you're not the biggest sinner, like, you just don't understand yourself. You're missing the heart of the gospel. Secondly, you're, if you're overly confident maybe in your own goodness, it goes right along with the first one, right? You may have sort of this older brother mentality. When it comes to God, think, following God, you may be like, you know what, I kinda, I'm pretty good at this. Right? I sort of got this down pat. Now, I've been doing this a while now, I sort of know the rules, I sort of know what I need to do, I say the right things, I go to the right places, I avoid certain temptations. The older brother says to his father, all these years, I've never disobeyed, I, I've never disobeyed your orders, and you kind of feel the same way. That's sort of that older brother mentality. Or maybe you're offended by grace. Maybe you're, for the older brother mentality, you think, you know what, people get what they deserve. They get what they deserve. If you do something wrong, you ought to pay for it, right? That, that's, just, that's just the way it, it ought to work, right? Remember Jonah? That was Jonah's. Uh, Jonah, well, God calls Jonah to go to Nineveh to preach. He didn't want to. You know what he said? Like, I don't like those people. I really don't want to go to Nineveh because, I, you know, I, I, I know what might happen. 
In fact, Jonah says it like this because he goes and he preaches and, and they repent and God forgives them. And, and he says in, in chapter 4, verse 2, he prayed to the Lord, Isn't this what I said, Lord? When I was still at home, this is what I tried to, this is why I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you were a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it's better for me to die than to live. Jonah was offended by grace. It's like, God, I knew you were compassionate. I knew you were slow to anger. I'm slow, you know, but not me, right? I mean, so sometimes that older brother mentality, you're, you're offended by God's grace. Or maybe you're okay with grace to have this mentality, but you think, you know what, works really makes the difference. It's really all about sort of my, my works, right? You, you've made it up your mind, yeah, I'm saved by grace, but now it's up to me. I, I'm saved by grace. I mean, yeah, Jesus came along, and he got me right in the back relationship with God, but now in order to stay there, like, it's up to me. I got to do this. I have to work. I have to make things right. I have to, like, I have to make sure that I'm doing, doing, doing in order to please God. Or you may have this older brother syndrome if you get easily angered when things don't go your way particularly maybe at church, right? Maybe a change happens or you don't like something. And then the automatic default mechanism is to think about how many years you've been a member here, how much money you've given, what all the things that you've done. The older brother said, all these years I've been slaving for you. You never threw a party. You may say, well, you know, all these years I've been a member here and I, 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 I don't, like, I should have a say. That's older brother mentality or perhaps the last one that you only come to church or read scripture read the bible and serve god out of merely a religious duty instead of an ongoing relationship with your heavenly father i know i've been here in the past I have to battle to not be here even still today right i, I know there have been times where you know I, I read the Bible each day, and I don't say that to, to brag. I say that because I need, some, I need God's Word deep in me, or I, like it just, uh, I need that spiritual nourishment. Um, but if I don't, and I, and I want you to read God's Word, like if, I could, if there's any single discipline that I could get you to do for your walk with Jesus, I would say read the Bible every day. Um, but when I don't, or if I don't, there's a chance that I'm... Or, 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 or maybe times where if I, uh, that I do it um, only because I know it's on my to-do list. And I got to do it, right? And um, instead of going because I want to grow and because I need God's Word and at time with my Savior, I'm just doing it to check it off, right? But when we do that or any other religious practice, just because we think God's going to be upset if we don't, we're no different than the Pharisees. We're no different than the religion, like any other religion in, in the world. See, the fact that Jesus, church, the fact that Jesus provided a way for you and me to have a relationship with God separates Christianity from any other religion in the, in, in the world. And it's not a, being a disciple of Christ is not a checklist to get done so that you're right with God. It's trusting in the complete work of Jesus and living your life to his lordship as a result. Amen? Does that make sense? See, the older brother wasn't any better than the younger brother. They're both lost. It was just one left home and the other didn't. See, uh, Keller again said it like this. Uh, he said, everybody knows that the Christian gospel calls us away from the licentiousness of the younger brotherness. But few realize that it also condemns moralistic elder brotherness. Does that make sense? Do I need to read that again? Uh, he's, I'll read it one more time. Everybody knows, he says, that the Christian gospel calls us away from the licentiousness of, the younger, of younger brotherness. But few realize that it also condemns moralistic elder brotherness. In other words... Christianity is not a license to sin. 
It's not a license to be able to, to live and act and do whatever you, you want to. That, that, like to have any disregard for God just because, well, God's just going to shower me with His grace. No, no, no. That's licentiousness. That's not the case. The gospel, like, that, that's not it. Nor are we saved or are you saved by your ability to behave. You're not saved because you're so moral. You're not saved because you're, you, you never make any mistakes. That's moralism. The gospel calls us away from both places and puts the emphasis on Christ. Amen? Listen, you have freedom, and uh, in Christ we have freedom, but there's always a desire to obey. That freedom that comes with the gospel and knowing who Jesus is and what he's done frees us up and takes so much burden and the pressure off of us, right? But it also, like, but now as a result of God's mercy and grace, it makes us want to obey and do the right things and trust Him and, uh, and live our, our life for Him. I hope that, that, I hope that that's clear. I know it's sometimes hard to, to get our minds around, but uh, that's just the, what the gospel preaches. Let me just give you a few things. As we wrap this series up and as we sort of bring this to a close, just two quick things uh, to take home with you. First, we need to celebrate prodigals because heaven does. We celebrate prodigals because heaven does. Well, we mentioned this last week but, and even this morning, but Jesus tells these three parables about grace in Luke 15. And, and this is what he says just prior to that, that parable. This is the, the second one. He says this in verse 8. Suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp and sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of angels, of God over one sinner who repents. I believe that was actually on, on, that, on that video, if, I, if I'm correct, right? Listen, church, if you don't like it, if you don't like to celebrate when people make decisions for Christ, or, or when those who have been far away from God come home, you're not going to like heaven much. Heaven celebrates those things. Jesus said the angels in heaven rejoice when a sinner turns uh, from his or her sin. And just by the way, track with me, on a side note, you are your brother's keeper. All right, you, you are your brother's keeper. The older son, what did he want to do? He wanted to place all the blame on his father. Do you see what he kept saying? This son of yours. This son of yours. He squandered everything. This son of yours. But notice what the father says in verse 31. Slide back down. He says, my son, you're always with me. Everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours... <laughs> This brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. He said, yeah, I am his father, but don't forget you're his brother. And you got some responsibility here as well. See, church, we've got a role in evangelism. God calls us to seek out those who are far from God. We are our brother's keeper. And I think we have to ask ourselves, as it pertains to the, the people that we see Jesus hanging out with and eating with, listen, if these are the type of people that were attracted to Jesus, tax collectors, sinners, the outcasts, people today that we, you know, that you and I look at and are like, you know what, them folks are far from God. Those folks are on the other side. You know, whatever it may be, they're so attracted to Jesus. Why aren't they attracted to us? They wanted to be around Jesus. And I think at least part of the reason is because we've acted like the older brother too long. See, there's a real danger in acting like the older brother. Instead of showering with grace and love and mercy, we just hit them with truth. And don't misunderstand me. We need truth. And we've got to share truth because truth without love isn't truth. Uh, because, well, because love without truth isn't love right? Like, love without giving someone, telling them the truth, that just really isn't love. But if they're turned off by us, and they weren't turned off by Jesus, something's out of line. And my suspicion is, is that we've been heavy on truth and light on grace. Um, 
we have to be a church that's committed to loving the prodigal. Jesus said it's not the healthy who need a doctor, it's the, it's the sick. I've not come to call righteous, I've come to call sinners to repentance. Listen, I, I'm happy that our church at FCC, that we're growing numerically. I'm happy that we have new people visiting each week. Uh, I, like I, Just to see what like God, I think, is like just recently, just visitors. and like I'm so excited about that. But let's face it, much of our growth is transfer, and that's fine. We want to plant grass. We're going to plant grass, and we're going to feed all the sheep that show up. But I want to celebrate, in addition to that, new faith and repentance. I want to celebrate those first-time decisions. And that only happens when you and I take evangelism seriously. We are our brother keeper. We are our brother's keeper. We, that's the commission that Jesus has given us, right? He said, go, make disciples of all nations. Go, go, baptizing them, teaching them to obey me, right? Trust in me. Secondly, so we're going to celebrate grace, because none of us are good. We're going to celebrate prodigals because that's what heaven does. But we're going to also celebrate grace. None of us are good. Now, I know that many of you have been faithfully serving God for so many years. And your contribution to the kingdom is invaluable. But if you focus on, if the focus of your life is your spiritual resume to get you into heaven, you're going to be sadly disappointed. Paul drives that point home in Romans 3. He quotes the Old Testament. He says, it's written. In other words, this, I'm just saying what God's already said in the past. There is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is, there is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. You want the 2023 Baldwin, Mississippi translation of that? Church, get over yourself, right? Just get over yourself. You're not that good. You're sunk without grace. I'm sunk without grace. We are in big trouble, but for the grace of God, you, there I go. Like every time we see someone make a big mistake, ruin their life, do something, we ought to just say, remind ourselves, but for the grace of God, that's me right? We're one or two dumb decisions away from absolutely wrecking everything. But for the grace of God, that's, that's me right there, right? Imagine, imagine it like this. Imagine you've got a friend named Bob who comes to you and says, you know what, I want to give you a gift. And he goes out and he buys you a $90,000 vehicle. And you say, Bob, you know what, that's too much. I can't, I can't accept that. And so you offer him a quarter to help him pay. And so he pays $89,999.75, and you pay $0.25. Cents. And so you're driving down the road, and someone says, you know what, that's a nice car. Like, that's really good. And so you say, yeah, me and my friend Bob bought this, all right? Me and Bob bought this. Now, that would be an insult to Bob, wouldn't it? It ain't you and Bob. No, Bob bought that car, right? That's what Paul says in Ephesians 2. He says, read this with me. For, you don't have to read it. I'm going to get you to say some things. Though. For it is by grace that you've been saved. Have you been saved? It's by what? Grace. It's by grace that you've been saved. Or is it because you've been good? Is it because you've been able to obey the rules? Is it because you've been able to follow all the right things? No, no. It is by grace that you've been saved. Through faith. Through faith. We're saved by grace through our self. Is this for me? Is it for me? Like, is it me? Just pack, like, I got to muster up as much faith as I can? Like, if, is there, like I have to have enough faith or I'm not going to be? Well, is it for me? It's not from your, it's not from yourselves. It's not from yourselves. What is it? It's a gift. It's a gift of God. That's what grace is. It's a gift. Well, I got to earn it. I got to do something for it. I got to put, I got to do, it's not by works. It's not by works. Why? Because that would puff us up. That would make us proud. Well, I'm a Christian. I'm going to go to heaven because of what? No, no, you, you're a Christian. You're going to go to heaven, not because you've been so good, because you've been, no, because of the grace of God. It's God's grace that you're saved. It's God's grace that's done the work. It's we put our faith in Jesus. If we're doing anything, we're just holding on and just to his 
complete and finished work on the cross. That's what we do. It's by grace. It's his mercy that we've been saved. It wasn't you and Jesus. It's just Jesus. It's just Jesus. And you know what happens when we place the burden of goodness like on ourselves? You know what, we, what happens when we make it all about, like we're acting like the older brother and we make it all about our spiritual resume and doing enough? You know what happens when we do that? It takes the joy out of serving. It's like we, we're serving not because of what God's done. We're serving because we have to or we're going to go to hell. Listen, we don't serve because we're going to go to hell if we don't. We serve because the blood of Jesus has saved us from hell. And God is good. Amen? That's why we serve, right? We get it so backwards sometimes. The older brother wasn't happy serving. You see the difference? What he say? All these years. All these years I've been slaving for you. All these years I've been doing this. But when you see God as a loving father who has literally given his son for you, you want to serve him. When you see God as a God who loves you and has adopted you and has brought you into his family and is, uh, offers a, 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 a relationship with you and saves you from your sins, and like we want to serve him we want to obey him we want to do good we want to please him in every way and so which of these brothers which of these categories do you do you fit into where do you identify maybe the most maybe a, a little bit of both the good news today jesus seeks both sons he seeks both sons uh, look at the end of this parable again in verse 31 my son the father said, you're always with me. Everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Both sons are welcome at home by Jesus. Both sons are welcome at home by Jesus. Uh, in, in, in Ottoman's book, uh -huh, he, uh, he shares a letter that was written to him by a friend. And I'm going to read this as I wrap things up and we wrap this series up today. He, it says this in his letter. Eight years ago, I left home and I went to Colorado State University. I was in a fraternity and I majored in partying. For the first three semesters, I never stopped and thought about what I was doing. I wasn't praying at all. After three semesters, reality came crashing in on me. I could no longer deny what was happening. I'd flunked four of my five classes. It was a wake-up call. I knew I needed to make some changes. I needed to get out of the fraternity and lose some of my friends. But what I really needed was to make a change in my relationship with God, if he would still have me. In the frat house, this young man writes, at the time there was no place with privacy to make a, a phone call to my parents to explain that I had failed. This was pre-cell phone. He said, so I took the phone into the bathroom, and I remember there was a stack of pornography. I didn't want to look in that direction, and so I sat on top of it. And he said, I called my parents, and I explained to them that I had blown it in a lot of areas in my life, not just with my grades, but also with my walk with Christ, that I had strayed from him. And this man said that my parents listened to what I had to say, and then they said just three words to me. They didn't say, turn things around. They didn't say, make things right. They didn't say, get some help. They didn't say, figure it out. They didn't even say, we love you. Or, we forgive you. It was better than that. What they said to me was just these three words, just come home. Just come home. And so whether you're a prodigal or an older brother, it doesn't matter. You can come home. But what matters is that you come home. What matters is that you turn from your sin. What matters is that today you say, you know, I'm fed up, I'm living like this. And again, this may even be an aha moment for you right now that you say, Lord, I am sorry. I'm turning from that junk. 
I'm not going to live that way. I want to trust you. My way is not working. I'm in the pig pen. I mean, gone far from you. Or maybe like you've never even trusted in Christ for the very first time. Whatever it may be, just go home. Just go home today. Turn to him. Your father is waiting with open arms. He loves you, cares for you. He sent his own son to die for you, that you would come home, that you would call on him, that you would trust him, and that you would walk with him in the newness of life. Would you pray with me? Father God, um, we're just so grateful, Lord, for all the things that you've done and you continue to do in our lives. God, we're thankful for your grace. We're thankful that, um, that, you've, that you meet us where we are. Many of us in here today, uh, or maybe even watching, we've been far away from you and um, been in a distant country, been disobedient, been trying to do life on our own. Lord, for many of us in here, um, our story is a little different. We're the older brother. We've been, um, we have been prideful and selfish and uh, arrogant. And so, Father, my prayer is regardless of wherever folks have come, wherever they land, Lord, that they would just turn to you, turn to Christ so they can come home. We love you. We ask you. We pray it all in Christ's name. Amen. We're going to sing a song and a song of invitation. Let's be standing, and we invite you to come if you've got a decision.